now for a time to make three pink. What would you like? Well, we finished the. Uh, every year, the government produces what they claim to be forecasts of uh, different economic variables, such as the underlying cash balance. But if you look at the forecasts that have been made each year and look at the actuals, it's pretty clear that they're not really forecasting, at least not in a statistical sense. When we think about forecasting statistically, we're trying to forecast the distribution of an unknown, um, you know, the, the future, the distribution of a variable which is not yet known, it's gonna be observed in the future. Uh, and so your forecast would normally be on the positive side about half the time and on the negative side about half the time. But if you look at the underlying cash balance forecast produced by the government, it's pretty clear that they're not trying to do that. They're trying to spin a story and I call these hope casts rather than forecasts because they don't really uh, aim to hit the middle of the distribution. Uh, when I tell people that um, uh, I do forecasting, people who are not in statistics, I'll have almost almost all of them will have one of two reactions. They will say something like, oh, do you do the weather? Uh, which I don't. Or they will say, oh, do you forecast the stock exchange? Which I don't. Uh, so there's plenty of things I don't forecast, but people's general uh, relationship with forecasting is often around one of those two things. Um, in fact, forecasting the stock exchange is, 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 is something that a lot of forecasters do think about and look at. I'm not very interested in it uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is there's not much signal there to work with. So as a statistician, it's not such an interesting problem. Uh, and secondly, I'm just more interested in human behavior than in things like what the stock market's doing. Um, forecasting the exchange rate is another thing. In fact, in my in my uh, undergraduate classes, I, I tell my students that if they want to try and forecast the stock market or the exchange rate, they're unlikely to be able to do better than using the current value uh, unless they have insider information, unless they have information that nobody else has, and that's largely illegal in Australia. Um, so you, you can produce better forecasts uh, than everyone else for the exchange rate if you know about things before everyone else knows about them, which a few people in the ABS do, uh, but most of us don't. Unfortunately, one of my students ended up working for the ABS, and uh, I don't know whether he took my, my uh, lectures to heart, but he did use the insider information and then spent time in prison as a result, so not a good idea. So what do I actually do if I'm not forecasting the weather or forecasting exchange rates or the stock market? So I'm gonna give you four examples here uh, that I've worked on as part of a consulting, my consulting work. So the first one is forecasting pharmaceutical sales. The second one I'm gonna look at is forecasting electricity demand. The third one, I will talk about forecasting COVID cases, which is one that I'm uh, currently engaged with. So the first two, the, the pharmaceutical uh, sales and the electricity demand are things that I worked on earlier in my career, COVID cases I'm working on right now. Um, and uh, forecasting Australian tourism recovery after the pandemic is something that I worked on last year. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But before I do any of those things, I just thought it might help put us, put us in the right sort of frame of mind is to think about forecasting different things. So here's, here's a list of eight things and I want you to think about which of these is the easiest ones to forecast. And uh, if you were sitting in my undergraduate class, we'd, we'd divide into groups and we'd try to order these into um, the easiest at the top, number one, all the way down to the hardest one to forecast at the bottom, number eight. So we'd, we'd put them in rank order about which is the easiest to forecast. Um, it's a little trickier on Zoom and with a lot of people, we, we won't do that as a group activity, but let me just show you what we usually come up with in, in the class, is we reorder them like this, where the easiest thing to forecast is at the top and the hardest thing to forecast is at the bottom. Um, and in doing this exercise, a few questions usually come up in the discussion. One of which is, well, how do you measure what's easiest? What do you mean by easiest to forecast? And we'll come to that. And 
what is it that makes it easy to what is it that puts some things high on the list and other things down the bottom of the list what is it that makes something easy or something difficult to forecast so if you look at the things on this list the ones that i've got at the top are two astronomical things the timing of sunrise which is incredibly easy to forecast in fact it's so regular um, and so little noise associated with it that we often don't even think of that as a forecast and that similarly the timing of Halley's Comet is also a very regular event and extremely easy to forecast if you know um, if you know the orbit. A little more difficult is the temperature uh, tomorrow, but that's actually a lot easier than some of the other things on this list. Then we've got daily electricity demand in a few days' time, sales of drugs in pharmacies, and then I've got the stock prices and exchange rates which are ordered based on how far ahead we're trying to forecast. Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? Is it in six months time? So why does it come out like this? What, what is it about the things at the top of the list that make them easy and the things at the bottom of the list that make them hard? So I've been asked this a few times in different contexts and I came up with a list of uh, four things that make something easy to forecast. First of all, you need a pretty good understanding of the factors that contribute to it, and you can measure those factors. Um, and certainly that's true for anything in, in the, that's astronomical. It's also true for the weather. We have a very good understanding of how the weather systems work, and we have a pretty good um, system these days of measuring them. And so our short-term weather forecasts are actually extremely good. Whereas for something like a stock price or an exchange rate, um, you know, they're subject to all sorts of, of weird fluctuations that we don't really know what's causing them, um, or if we do, we can't measure them. We, so the second thing we need is lots of data available. Um, third thing, you want the future to be somewhat similar to the past, and I'll show you some examples where that spectacularly fails. And uh, lastly, it's easier if the forecast can't affect the thing you're trying to forecast. So for something like the weather or astronomy, our forecasts are not going to affect what happens. The weather doesn't care what we forecast. Whereas something like a stock price or an exchange rate, if we publish them and we're a well-known forecaster, then that can affect what other people are prepared to pay for the stock or the, or the currency, and therefore our forecasts affect the thing we're trying to forecast. Or in the case of COVID, if I put out a forecast that goes to the government, they may take a policy response and change restrictions and then of course the forecasts will be wrong because they were based on a different set of assumptions, a different environment. So something's easy if we've got all four of these things and if any of them are, are not true then it becomes a little more difficult. Okay let me now talk a little bit about what I mean by a forecast. I haven't actually defined it properly. Um, so I just mean it's an estimate of the probability distribution of a variable to be observed in the future. Uh, and so forecasting is really about estimating conditional probability distributions, conditional on things we know about. Um, let me give you an example. So here's short-term visitors to Australia. This is monthly data um, from the year 2000 up until 20, um, end of 2018, end of 2017, sorry. And we're going to forecast the next few years ahead. So I, I have done quite a lot of work for Tourism Australia doing this sort of thing. This example is not from that work, but it's the same sort of thing. So one of the ways to think about forecasting is you're looking at possible futures that could occur. So each future is a, is a sample path drawn from a random distribution of sample paths. And so the future could unfold like that, or it could unfold like that, or like that, and so on. So you build up a distribution of futures which are uncertain and as we build up the all of the possible simulated future sample paths you get an idea what the probability distribution is at each of the future time periods and so eventually if you do this enough you have a very rich idea of the empirical distributions and then you can do things like you can produce um, prediction intervals let me just zoom in on that section so you can see that i've taken the um, thousand simulated sample paths and I've found the 50% um, interval and the 90% interval which covers those sample paths. And usually we're not actually doing um, simulations when we do forecasting because we have mathematical models and we can 
derive analytically what those distributions should be, at least for, for some of the models, not all of them. Uh, but in, in um, conceptually, that's what's going on, as you're thinking about simulating the future um, and looking at what the distribution is of those simulated future sample paths. So these ones came from an, what's called an ETS model, which is a model I developed or helped develop with other people. Um, and I'll tell you where, how that came about shortly. Um, in this case, our forecasts, uh, I've, I've now overlaid the actual values on top of our forecast distributions. So the black is what actually happened um, over 2018, 2019, and the first part of 2020. And you can see that the forecasts are actually pretty good for 2018 and 2019, and for the first couple of months of 2020. The true values lie inside the 50% interval about half the time and they lie inside the 90% interval, about nine times in 10, which is what you would expect. Um, so that looks pretty good. But of course, in this section here, things went spectacularly wrong because our model didn't allow for that type of change in the environment. So there's an example where the future was not similar to the past. Um, when the future was similar to the past, our model did really well. Okay, let me now go to the, to the first of the four cases um, and talk about what, what we did and what we might learn from these examples. So this is forecasting pharmaceutical benefit expenditure. Um, I got involved with this about 20 years ago. Um, for those who don't know, the PBS is the Australian Government Drug Subsidy Scheme. When you go to the pharmacist and buy um, some drugs, they're subsidised to allow more equitable access. So you pay some money and the government will pay the rest. Um, of course, the government doesn't know who's going to go to the chemist in advance. And so it's a forecasting problem to know how much money they're going to have to pay each year to subsidize the drugs. And it's been worth about 1% of GDP for most of the last 20 years. So it's a very substantial part of the Australian budget. Um, when I got involved, uh, it was around this time, so this was May 2001. This was the ABC website, which is uh, interesting to see what websites looked back then. Uh, nowhere near as uh, fancy as they are now. But you can see that in the headlines, um, the federal opposition was calling for tighter controls on bug drug prices after the PBS budget blew out by almost $800 million. That's a big difference between what they were forecasting they had to spend and what they actually had to spend. And it was around that point that I got a phone call from someone within the Department of Health and Aging in Canberra saying, can you help us with our forecasting? Um, at that point, the budget was about four and a half billion dollars and they were under forecasting by nearly a billion. So it was a huge error in forecasting. So I asked them about the problem and they said, well, we have thousands of products on the PBS. The demand's highly seasonal um, and it's difficult because it's subject to covert marketing. Uh, covert because it's actually illegal to explicitly advertise for drugs on the PBS in Australia. So companies will, um, will do it covertly by, for example, I might say, uh, you know, do you suffer from rheumatoid arthritis? Um, ask your GP about new, uh, about new treatments without naming the drug. So that's, a, that's legal, that's allowed. And then people will go along and ask their GP and the GPs have been primed to um, sell the new drug. Um, so there's covert marketing going on. The products are very volatile. Uh, some products come off the PBS and then go back onto it. So it's not a stable um, collection of products and there's no way the government can control the expenditure. So it sounded like an interesting problem. Um, and I said, well, how much data do you have? And they said they had monthly data for about 10 years at that stage, but they weren't sure how to deal with monthly data. So they were aggregating it to annual data. And then they were worried about some of the data quality issues that they were using the first three years, not the last three years, the first three years of, da of data, three numbers, seven years old. And then I, at this point, I was a little worried about whether I'd understood the problem properly and it, Currently, I had. And I said, well, what do you do with the three numbers? And they said, we use the forecast function in Excel, which fits a linear trend, a straight line. So fitting a straight line through three numbers. At that point, I knew that I was going to be able to help them because whatever I did was going to be better than that. 
Um, the problem is actually uh, they divide, you, do, you can divide drugs into groups and there's 14 big groups. Um, this is on, called a drug, the ATC drug classification. And then that's subdivided into small groups. There's 84 of those sort of subgroups and that's subdivided. And there's actually five levels of this. And we chose to forecast at the second level um, because it gave us the best, uh, the best accuracy. Um, these days I would do it differently, but that's using methods that we've developed since 2001. Back then, uh, hierarchical forecasting didn't, uh, hadn't been fully developed and we were having to do it on these subgroups. Just to show you what some of the data looks like, this was a very well-behaved series and the model that we ended up fitting looked like that. This is not at the time, this was on a, I've done several iterations of this consulting project with the Department of Health and Aging, and this was on a later one, so you can see the data is a bit more recent. Um, that's another product that also was relatively easy to forecast. Um, here's one where you get a period where it uh, dropped suddenly because drugs came off the register and then they went back on, um, and then it, various other changes was causing it to drop down. And our forecasts here are pretty bad, uh, as you can see by the huge prediction intervals, which actually go negative, which doesn't make any sense in this case. Um, here's another one where um, it looks relatively well behaved and then all of a sudden there's this big jump because a, a product came onto the market that wasn't previously there um, and caused this huge increase. And our model has really not done well in adapting to this change uh, and induced some spurious seasonality. So you can see it's quite difficult sometimes because of the weird behavior of the data. Here's one where it does pretty well and another one where it does pretty well. Okay, so where did these forecasts come from? Um, the, uh, as, as part of this consulting project, we developed an automatic forecasting algorithm for exponential smoothing um, using a new thing, a, a new ver form of exponential smoothing using state space models based, and we introduced the idea that you could select these based on the AIC. So it was a completely automated approach the first time I think there'd been a completely automated approach to exponential smoothing that worked in this way. Um, and it was highly adaptive so that if things changed, it should adapt to the new situation. Um, and it reduced the mean absolute percentage error, which is one way of measuring forecast accuracy. It reduced the mean absolute percentage error from between 15 and 20% down to about 0.6%. Um, so, between, so instead of about $800 million, it was down to about plus or minus $50 million, which was much more reasonable. Um, so as a result of this, the theory and the algorithm uh, that we developed for it came out as a paper and then many other papers developed the theory further and eventually a full length book. And it's now implemented in R as the ETS function in the forecast package or the uppercase ETS function in the fable package and in lots of other packages and software. Um, Tableau, for example, uses the same algorithm now for its forecasts. Um, a lot of different software that produces forecasting, time, time series forecasts now use the algorithm we developed that came originally from this PBS project. Excel, of course, likes to jump on board with things. So they introduced their forecast.ets function, but it does something completely different, it doesn't follow the algorithm and gives terrible forecasts. Um, Generally, Excel is extremely unreliable about anything that involves statistics. Um, so why did this work this, this work so well? Well, we had a very good understanding of what was contributing to, to the factors. Like we knew exactly what drugs were being sold and why, and in most cases, why they were being, um, why the changes were being made when things came on and off the, the PBS. There's, there was plenty of data, um, 10 years, back in 2001, and now there's about 30 years of good data. The forecast mostly was somewhat similar to the past. There were some cases where it wasn't, um, but generally that worked pretty well. And the forecast did not affect the thing we're trying to forecast because it didn't matter what forecast, it wasn't gonna change the way people turned up at the chemist. So that worked, um, that worked reasonably well because of these factors. Let me give you a second example. Uh, come forward a few years, I was working um, I, I, was, I was in my office at Clayton at Monash, um, not at all thinking about electricity demand. And I had a phone call from somebody who's from South Australia who said they were from the electricity um, 
market operator in South Australia, which doesn't exist anymore, but um, and they wanted to forecast the peak electricity demand in a half hour period in 20 years time. They had 15 years of half hourly data, a lot of temperature data, some economic and demographic data, and it was in South Australia, which they said was the most volatile electricity demand in the world. So this got me really excited because there's so much data and there's such a strong relationship between the drivers, temperature and calendar effects and, and demography and the demand. Um, and they were interested in not just the mean, which is sort of not very interesting for a statistician, but they were interested in the tail of the distribution. They wanted to know about the, the extreme tails of this forecast distribution. So of course I said, yeah, I'll have a look at this and uh, worked on it for a few years. So I'm not gonna show you the South Australia one. I'm gonna show you some Victorian data from a little later. So this is Victorian statewide demand, half hour statewide demand over three years. So you can see the seasonality with summer extreme peaks, winter much better behaved, but the heating peak in winter here, um, and then back to a, a fairly volatile summer again. If I zoom in on just one summer over 2013, 2014, you can see a little bit more detail what's going on. You get a, a weekly pattern, which is this pattern here. So this is a weekend. Um, and you get a daily pattern, which are these little ups and downs here. Um, and then you get these periods like this section here, where there's um, quite high demand because of uh, high temperatures. And you get uh, other periods where it's relatively low demand, such as here, because it was a cooler period. In fact, if I put the temperature data underneath, you can see very much that this is being driven by these temperatures here. This spike is being driven by this temperature and so on. If I, let's plot demand against temperature and uh, you can see there's a pretty strong relationship um, with a heating and a cooling component. A cooling component up here and high temperatures and a heating component down here. So it's a non-linear relationship. In fact, if I split it up into work days and non-work days, you can see that the work days are higher than the non-work days. And if I just uh, go forward and show you what it looks like through the day, you can see that it, uh, in the middle of the night, work days and weekdays are much the same and there's not much of a temperature response except if it's very hot, hot nights. Um, but as the day goes forward, this is the time of day here in this little box. As the day goes forward, you can see the work days and the weekdays separate, the temperature demand, the, the temperature relationship gets stronger. Um, and uh, so you can see that it's peaking here in late afternoon, It'll, the very peaks of the demand will happen on a work day in the late afternoon. You can see there's a few work days which have pretty low demand. They tend to be days that are officially work days, but where not many people work. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, 27th or 28th or 29th of December between Christmas and New Year, which are work days, but a lot of people are on holidays. Um, so there's a lot going on here. There's, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening and we can try and model what's doing this with a nonlinear model. Oops. So there's calendar effects, time of day, day of week, time of year, there's holiday effects, there's weather conditions, not just the current conditions, but recent conditions also have an effect. There's climate change if we're going forward more than a few years. There's demand response incentives. So companies will try to um, encourage people not to use so much power at certain times of the day. Um, there's better air conditioners being installed, so that makes a difference. And there's economic and demographic changes. So a lot of interesting stuff going on, which makes this a really interesting problem. And it means we have a very good understanding of the factors that contribute to it. So um, condition one is satisfied. There's lots of data. Condition two is satisfied. The future is somewhat similar to the past. Condition three is satisfied. And four, the forecast can't affect the thing we're trying to forecast. That's also satisfied. So that, what, that's why I thought this was a really good problem to get involved with, because I was pretty sure that it was going to be forecastable in the sense of satisfying these conditions. I mean, at the time, I hadn't worked out these four conditions, but um, intuitively, it felt like it was going to be going to be doable at the time. OK, let's come forward now to uh, more recent work, forecasting COVID-19 cases. Uh, so this problem, of course, is, uh, is an ongoing interest to all of us because these forecasts 
actually go to the state governments and the national government and are directly um, well, they're fed into some of the decision making that happens around our restrictions. So we tell you briefly how it happens and then I'll show you some of the forecasts. So the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee is a decision making committee for national health emergencies. It's a long standing committee uh, and it comprises all the state and territory chief health officers and is chaired by the Australian Chief Medical Officer. And so when COVID-19 looked like it was going to be a problem, uh, this committee decided they needed to get some forecasts from some experts. And so they approached uh, people at the Doherty Institute and they put together a team and you can see the team here or most of them, there's, there's probably the team sort of changed a little bit over time so that some people might, I might have missed some people here. But I got, in, I got asked very early on in, in March 2020 to join this group to help with the forecasting. And some of the other people are there. Some of whose names you might know if, you're, uh, um, if they come from your institution or you're working in this space. Um, so we put together a, a few different models um, using the data that was available. So the models that we use, we, we currently use are the ones we, we um, are based on the ones we put together way back in March 2020. The models haven't really, the, the structure of the models haven't really changed much. We've changed the mod, the, some of the details and some of the data and the parameterization over time, but the basic ideas have been in place since March 2020. Um, first of all, we use case level data of all positive COVID-19 tests, um, where we get the onset times and the detection times for every, every positive test in Australia. We have daily population mobility data from some of the big tech companies, which helps us to look at things like um, how well people are um, obeying restrictions. Are they staying home? Are they going to work? Are they in shopping centers? Are they in parks and gardens? And there's two weekly surveys that are conducted, one on how many non-household contacts people have and one on other behavioral things. And they feed into some of these models as well. And then we have daily case numbers from lots and lots of countries and regions via the Johns Hopkins COVID-19 repository, which collects data from all sorts of places. From all of those different sorts of data, we have, um, or before I show you the models, here's what the cases looked like that we had. Uh, this, is, this is the data as of today, actually. Um, we use date of symptom onset, not date of reporting. So if you look at this, you say, well, here's Victoria, this dark blue, and uh, the, there's the peak in the big, the big peak we had in the second lockdown last year. And some of you from Victoria might remember, no, no, it was around 700 cases, wasn't it? There were 700 reported cases, but we are doing by date of symptom onset, not by date of reporting. And the, the lags in reporting meant that there was some um, accumulation of cases on some days and we've um, distributed them back according to the date of symptom onset. Uh, so the peak was actually a little less than 500. This light blue line is the current New South Wales outbreak, um, which has just passed the Victorian one in terms of date of symptom onset numbers of cases. And the current thing that's happening in Victoria is this little blue one just down here. Um, so that's, that's the thing we're trying to forecast is these numbers here, but we're not just using these numbers, we're using all of that other data I just described. So we have three models, one of which is largely put together by the people at the University of Melbourne and the Doherty Institute, which is a classical, or at least built on top of a classical SEIR model. Um, it's more sophisticated than the usual uh, vanilla version. Um, then there's a generative model, like a bit like an agent-based model from the University of Adelaide. And then there's a global autoregression model. That's a time series model, but it's built not just on one time series, but on hundreds of time series and that's put together by my group. And there are other people involved as well, um, not just these three uh, universities named. Um, and so each of these models produces a prediction distribution and from the prediction distributions, we, we put a, make a mixture. So we mix the three together to form one prediction distribution and that's the distribution that goes to the governments. Um, this tends to work best when the individual models use different types of data and tend to be a little bit overconfident because they're not allowing for all of the uncertainties. 
Um, I'll show you later on whether the ensembling actually helps. Um, this is what some of our forecasts have looked like in the last uh, year. Um, so that was uh, in September last year. And so I'm showing here the 50%, 60, 70, 80, and 90% regions in the different shades of blue. And the actuals are in black. Um, and remember, the, the, um, we're not just using what you see in the black line. We're also using a lot of other data. Um, that was uh, towards the end of November after a long period of zeros. Um, and you can see we were forecasting potential increases. Um, and in fact, one we, ha we had some towards the end of December. Uh, that was in uh, end of April. And that's our forecast didn't do so well here. Um, this was an outbreak that took place in May. And our, we didn't predict this. Um, our, it was outside our 90% region. That was forecast done last June um, and so on. So you can see the sort of things. And we do this for every state um, every week and have done since March 2020. Um, so how does this work with my four factors? We do have a very good understanding of what's contributing to the, what's going on here, because we know about distancing. Um, we know about transmission rates. Um, at least we do now. We didn't really know so much back in March, but we have a pretty good understanding of the factors that contribute to this now. There is now quite a bit of data available. Again, there wasn't much in March and we were scrounging around trying to figure out how to fit some of these models, but we now have plenty of data. The future is um, not that similar to the past because of changing regulations. So our forecasts are always based on current conditions. If the current conditions continue, this is what we expect will happen. The current conditions never continue because governments will change the rules. They will uh, introduce new lockdowns or introduce masks or something else. And so the future is never the same as the past in some way. And in fact, the past has not been a consistent environment either. Um, so that's problematic. And then lastly, the forecasts do really affect the thing we're trying to forecast because of the change in policies as a result of the forecasts. So this is a challenging problem because only two of these four conditions are actually satisfied. Let me go to my, my fourth example, um, which is to do with uh, another pandemic uh, problem. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this was forecasting tourism numbers. And this came about because uh, this, this started in December 2019 when we were asked by uh, Tourism Australia, the peak national tourism body, whether we could produce some review the way they were doing forecasting and produce our own forecasts for the next few years. From December 2019, right? So we said, yeah, that sounds good. And we got a whole lot of data over January. We were working hard at building some models. By the end of January, we're thinking, this might not, these models might not be so good because it looks like we've got a major event coming that we haven't allowed for. And so in February, 2020, we pivoted and changed our methodology completely. And we said, well, how can we forecast what the recovery might look like? And we did that using, because we didn't have any data on that. So we did it using judgmental forecasting methods with a survey of about 440 uh, tourism experts about the way they saw the future unfolding and a little bit of other um, combination of some statistical work as well. And we came up with forecasts that looked like this. So this was done um, in early 2020. Um, I'm just showing you the data up until um, towards the end of 2019. And we had, oh, I've left off the legend, sorry. So the, um, the legend here, the, the pink one is our pessimistic forecast and the greeny one is our optimistic forecast. And the, um, one of these other ones was a sort of most likely forecast. And then we had a mixture distribution again, where we had weighted them. That's <coughs> looking like our pessimistic forecast was, um, was much more, but was a much better forecast than any of the other ones. Um, also note here how incredibly wide the prediction intervals are. So these, in, these prediction intervals are huge. Uh, which is essentially telling the government that we have no idea what's going to happen uh, in a year or two years time. Um, but that's important to know that you have no idea what's going to happen. The, the, 
So having a huge prediction interval is not non-informative, it is informative. It's informative that you don't know where things are going to happen, what's going to occur. Um, so in this case, we, um, while we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on, we have no idea um, about how it's going to unfold in the future because we don't know about the time horizons. There's almost no data available. In fact, there, is, there was zero data available. The future is totally different to the past. Um, so that the, those two items are, are not true and the forecast can't affect the thing you're trying to forecast that is true. Um, okay, let me just come to the last thing I want to talk about and then I'll come to uh, some of the questions. Um, so how do we assess whether our forecasts are any good? So I've been showing you forecast distributions. So a forecast is a distribution. So you want to know, well, is your distribution any good? But you only see one observation uh, for each distribution. You don't get to compare it with another whole distribution. You get to compare it against one number, the thing that happened in that time period that you were trying to forecast. So we need to find a way of measuring how good our forecast distribution is when we've only got a one number observation. So let me show you, uh, see if I can build up the ideas here. So suppose this is my forecast distribution, this black line, so this is a probability density function. And suppose my actual is here. Um, so the median of the distribution is the blue line here. Um, oops. Uh, there's a 90% interval is, is out, sorry, the 0.9 quantile is here. Um, so my actual was somewhere between the 50% and the 90% quantile. So what we can do is we can measure how good it, the distribution is for each quantile. So for the 0.9 quantile, um, I have a scoring function, which looks like this. I call this the quantile score. And wherever my actual value lies gives me the score associated with that quantile. So if I get to the right of the 0.9 quantile, I'm going to get a bad score because if that shouldn't happen very often. You don't expect it to be more extreme than the 0.9 quantile. If I'm to the left of the 0.9 quantile, that's what you'd expect. So it gets a much lower score. So you see this is asymmetric. The 0.7 quantile looks like that. Um, the 0.5 quantile looks like that. You can see my scoring function is now even because I'm equally likely to be above or below the 0.5 quantile, the 0.3 quantile, and so on. So you can see for each quantile, I'll get a score. And then I can, for each of those scores, I can uh, I, I record them. So I'm now going to run forward from, from P equals zero, probability zero to probability one. And for each quantile, I get a score. And I'm going to map out what those scores look like over here on the left. Okay, so I'm just running time, running the animation forward from the, the left-hand side of the distribution to the right-hand side of the distribution. And for every point along here, for every quantile along the distribution, I get a score. And so I now have a quantile score, which is a function of the probability of where it is on the density. Um, and that gives me this, this curve here. Let me just wait till that finishes. And then the area under that curve is called the continuous rank probability score. So it's a measure of how good my actual, my, how good my distribution is given the actual based on all of the probabilities. So that gives me a, a number for this one observation for this forecast distribution. And then I average it over all of the possible um, futures that I've got. Okay, I'm gonna skip this because I'm out of time. Let me just show you my last graph. Um, so if I run, if I do that, calculate the CRPS for the four biggest states in Australia for all of those COVID-19 case forecasts that I was showing you earlier, um, for the three models and for the ensemble, you can see that um, for some states, one of the models does better than the others. So for New South Wales in this period, um, from September 2020 to June 21, the SEIR model was doing reasonably well for the shorter horizons and the ensemble was doing best for the longer horizons, um, but all the models did okay. For Queensland, the SEIR model did really badly for the long horizons, whereas for Victoria, the 
SEI model did really well for all the horizons. So the different models do better under different in different contexts, but the ensemble always does reasonably well everywhere. And so it's quite valuable because it pulls together information from multiple models. And it's the ensemble that we actually use, equally weighted mixture of the three distributions when we provide forecasts to the government. Okay, let me answer my last question before I stop. Um, so my, my title said, uh, what can we forecast and when should we give up? So um, when should we give up? When should we not even try to forecast? Perhaps when there's insufficient data? No, I don't think so. Because in the case of the um, recovery from the pandemic, we had no data, but we could still produce a forecast. And I think the forecast was still useful because it demonstrated our uncertainty. Um, and I think that's a valuable outcome in itself. What about when the models give implausible forecasts? That certainly happens, but that's a modeling failure, not, a, not something that should mean you give up. It means you find a better model. Um, if your models are not giving you plausible forecasts, have a think about how to do a better model rather than giving up. What about when the forecast uncertainty is too large to assist decision-making? I don't think that ever happens because if the forecast uncertainty is very large, that itself should assist decision-making. Um, and if you don't provide the forecasts, somebody else is going to um, do them and probably not compute the uncertainty um, correctly. Uh, so I never say no to doing forecasting. Um, I, mean, I say no because I haven't got time, but I don't say no because of the nature of the problem. I think it's always worth trying to forecast the future um, using the best techniques we can find. Um, let me just finish by saying my slides are available uh, from this website, um, from my website. Just go to robjheinemancom slash uncertain futures. And if you need to uh, know anything else about me or contact me, there's some of the ways you can do so. And we'll stop there. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to go to the questions now. Um, let's, uh, so I'm just going to pick them off the chat. Is that okay, Jess, if I just go from the chat? Yes, thanks, Rob. Thank you very much. I'll just um, encourage everyone to give a round of applause, virtual applause, to, to thank you for that talk. And, and please, yeah, please do um, pick questions off, off the chat. Okay, so I'm just going to do them in order. So um, Anders Holmberg is asking, how much have you looked at overseas models and factors when you've worked on the COVID models? And what data would you love to add to your models? Um, so we have worked... Um, and look closely at what's going on in some other countries. The global AR model that I use was actually first developed for Spain. And my postdoc, who happens to be Spanish, was working with the Spanish pan, um, COVID team before he was working with us. And uh, that model was doing really well in, for the Spanish outbreak, which happened before ours, of course. And so we thought, let's pull it in. We also worked quite closely with the US um, modeling group, um, the, the, the CDC in the US. And uh, I know the head of that group quite well. And uh, we look at to see what they're doing. And although we don't use exactly the same models, we certainly stay in touch. Um, is it what data would I like to add? Um, oh, that's a good question. I think we have actually really good data. Um, and I'm not quite sure that we could get our hands on other data very easily um, for this problem. Um, for, for, for many problems, there is always you know, data I'd like to get. But for COVID, actually, I think we're doing really, really well at getting good data on mobility and on you know, social distancing um, and on cases. Sometimes there's a bit of a lag in getting that information, but it's you know, because we've been doing this for 18 months now, those lags are really short. And it's actually amazing how well the whole system is working in terms of getting data together and getting our forecasts out you know, within a day or two of updates to the data, we can produce new forecasts and provide them. So I don't think there's any significant source of data that we could have that would make much difference. Um, Andrew uh, Robinson saying, uh, talking about my comment on hope casting, uh, says, makes me wonder if the loss might be asymmetric. Do you have many examples in your casebook where the forecasts inform decisions that have asymmetric loss? What do you do? I think actually, most decisions have an asymmetric loss. That is, there's more of a danger to be on under forecasting than over forecasting. Um, and often it's a, it's a good point because often when we're doing the forecasts, we're forecasting some loss function. It might be the root mean squared error um, or it might be the CRPS. Um, 
and that might not be directly relevant to the decisions that are going to be made on the basis of the forecasts. And so one of the things we're currently looking at in my research group, and we have an ARC grant on this, is making forecasts where the loss function is related to the decision making rather than related to the forecast accuracy. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, Damien is asking, is there a difference between a prediction and a forecast? A really good question, and it's uh, there's some variation in the way people use it. Um, so these days I tend to use forecasts when I mean predicting something in the future, that is ahead of time, before something's been observed at a future time. Whereas prediction is more, gen more general, any type of prediction of something which might be um, you know, cross-sectional data set, just some unobserved observation, or it might be forecasting something in the past that you, um, you're trying to look backwards. So I tend to keep the word forecast now for future, but I haven't always done that. I used to use them interchangeably. Uh, Richard's asking, how strong is the seasonal pattern for COVID? Well, we've had 18 months of data now, so um, not really enough to have a good idea about seasonality, particularly since other things have been changing during that time, including variants and vaccinations. Um, so I don't know, don't yet know how strong the seasonality is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Tim Brown's asking, do you think the AHPPC and governments have understood the uncertainty adequately given all their pressures? Um, yeah, good question. I don't talk directly to them. That's done by other people in my group, um, no, notably um, James McCaw and Jodie McVernon. Um, James tells me that the AHPPC have been exceptionally good at trying to get their heads around understanding uncertainty, understanding probabilities and making sense of the types of things we provide them. So I think they've done a good job actually. Um, in understanding uncertainty. Um, I'm not so sure that some of the political players in the decision-making process have always understood that as well as AHPPC have done. Um, okay, next one, Yidi Yan's asking, how did you translate qualitative factors like policy change into factors to be used in the model? Um, well, it depends on which of these various case studies or whatever application I'm doing. Um, it depends on what's going on. So for, for the COVID stuff, we haven't been factoring in policy changes because our brief is to say, well, what is the forecast given current policy settings? There are other groups, um, including some people within that I named earlier, who are also producing scenario type forecasts where they say, well, if this happens, what would the distribution be like? Um, but I haven't been involved directly in that work. But normally I do do something like that. I'll give a scenario based forecast based on a proposed policy change where you have as a variable, one of the inputs in the model, something that you can then tweak. We do that, um, for example, with electricity demand um, where that we will provide a distribution if, um, you know, in 10 years time, if the GDP does something or other, or if the GDP does something else, we'll give them a couple of forecasts based on conditional values for the predictors in the model. Um, that's, that's probably the, for, for, for factors that don't change much like policies, that's what I would normally do. Um, okay, I'm not sure when you want me to stop Jess, but I'll keep answering questions. Well, we've got two more questions there, and I think we might draw a line after those two last questions. Okay. That's all right. No problem. Um, so Ian Gordon uh, says, empirical dynamic modelling makes very strong claims about modelling data, including causality. Some of these relate to time series. Do you have comments about this topic? No, I don't really have comments. Sorry, Ian, I don't work at all on causality issues. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of interested bystander. You may know more about it than me. Um, I'm usually working with observational data and I'm trying to forecast and I'm not trying to make too many causal claims. Um, Noel Cressy's, do you put prize on all your parameters or estimate all of them? Forecast intervals may not have the right coverage if you estimate parameters. Yes, yeah, so it varies uh, depending on which of these things I've just shown you. So for some of these models, we did have Bayesian um, implementations where we had prize on parameters and 
the forecast distributions did include parameter uncertainty. For others, including the PBS, um, for example, we had a, um, you know, a non-Bayesian implementation, a frequentist implementation, and pro, uh, parameter estimation was not taken into account. However, I have looked at the effect of parameter estimation on the size of my prediction intervals for those types of models, and it's tiny. A much bigger problem is model uncertainty rather than parameter uncertainty, because you're picking a model from a class of models, and that model may not be the right model. Um, and if you'd used a different model, you would get different forecasts, and that's much more of an issue than the parameter uncertainty. Um, and but yeah, a, a Bayesian approach is one way to deal with both of those things, both the model and the parameter uncertainty. And that's the end of the questions on the chat. Well, so, thank you yeah. very much, Rob. Um, everyone, please join me in another virtual round of applause, thanking Rob for absolutely fascinating glimpse into, into the world of forecasting. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, please enjoy your evening and uh, Hope to see you at, a, at another Stat Society event soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Bye.